Ireland is a rough, wild land buffeted by the waves of the Atlantic. But away from the rugged coast, the climate is mild. The countryside in the interior is mainly flat and gentle, with magical secret places to discover. Some bays and white sandy beaches look almost Mediterranean. The coast too is not all storms and crashing breakers. With romantic rivers and countless lakes, water is everywhere in Ireland. In the heart of the country, the rivers flow slowly through lush meadows and rolling hills. The Midlands are a charming, peaceful region. The network of inland waterways used to be of great importance for the life and the economy of Ireland. Barges were the main means of transport for heavy goods between Dublin and the interior. The Grand Canal and the Royal Canal both connect Dublin with the Shannon, Ireland's longest river. The canals were built more than 200 years ago. Nowadays, it's holiday makers who travel along the canals, exploring the gentler, cosier parts of Ireland away from the rugged coast and the lush vegetation of the south. The tempo on the waterways is very relaxed. Commercial inland shipping ended more than 60 years ago. This used to be the Grand Hotel at Shannon Harbour. It was completed in 1806 and flourished as long as countless Irish were heading west down the canal towards Atlantic ports to board ships to the New World. Shannon Harbour was once a very busy place. As transport and farming became ever more mechanized, horses became superfluous. They no longer had work to do. The famous Irish horses became idle. But the Irish still love their horses and spend a lot of free time with them. Ireland has the highest ratio of horses for sport and recreation to humans in Europe. Irish breeders are renowned and successful. And once a year they all go to Ballinasloe, 
and bring their horses along, washed and groomed and kitted out to look as grand as can be. A lot of money is at stake at the Ballinasloe Horse Fair. The fair starts every year on the first Saturday of October and draws up to 100,000 visitors. It's Europe's largest open-air horse market. It's held on a meadow right next to the church in this small country town. Illustrious domestic breeds are well represented, such as the Irish Cobb and the Irish Draft. They're sturdy working horses, large and strong, robust and gentle spirited. They're very popular for recreational riding. In the boom years at the start of the century, many newly moneyed Irish people bought themselves expensive ponies and horses. It was the thing to do. The market boomed. Then it imploded with the crash. Horses were abandoned, left to roam the countryside. The situation has since improved. Prices have been rising, and there's money to be made again at the Ballinasloe Horse Fair. Dermot Connolly has brought along a Connemara pony. The breed is versatile, athletic, steady and good-natured, and it's suited for racing and show jumping. Dermot has been coming to the fair for many years, and not just to do business. This horse fair is hundreds of years old. It has a fantastic tradition, not alone in Ireland, it's, but right throughout Europe. People come to uh, the Ballinasloe Horse Fair from Wales and Scotland, um, from France, and even from further afield. We've often had people uh, from, from other places as well. And even today, there's some girls here from Australia and places, you know. So um, the Ballinasloe Horse Fair is very famous and has the reputation of having supplied Na Napoleon himself with his uh, famous horse uh, called Moringo. So it's going back through the centuries and people come here looking for uh, a variety of types of horse. You know, it's a, a great melting pot. It brings all kinds of people here together and, and uh, it's a, an annual event for people to come from, particularly all throughout Ireland and they meet up with friends who maybe they haven't met with for the last 12 months, you know. Business is slow. The economic crisis is still taking its toll. Hardly anyone has stopped to admire Dermot's pony. Finally, someone takes an interest. But he says that at 2,000 euros, the price is too high. Ballinasloe lies in the Midlands. The area is made up of flat farming country, rolling hills, peat bogs and moors. The River Shannon runs through the heartland of Ireland. It's 370 kilometers long. The upper, northern reaches of the Shannon are shallow and broad. It often overflows its banks here. 
The wetlands are home to many birds, including the red shank and other rare species. The stretch of flat lands along the river between Athlone and Potumna is known as the Shannon Callows. It's a special area of conservation. Some parts may only be accessed in the company of park rangers. Cattle graze on the water meadows. That's why so few willows and alder, which often line river banks, grow here. Herons find plenty of fish at weirs and rapids. For the holiday makers on their cruises and for the animals along the banks, the Shannon Callows is a safe and tranquil place. These may well be the most peaceful and gentle landscapes in Ireland, a far cry from the dramatic, rugged Atlantic coast. Still, a very long time ago, this sleepy river was a major transport route and of great strategic significance. Almost at the very centre of Ireland, on the eastern bank of the Shannon, the monastery of Clonmacnoise was established in the 6th century. For several hundred years, the complex grew in size and importance. It became the intellectual, religious and cultural heart of Ireland. The spot was relatively accessible and that meant it was vulnerable to enemies and plunderers. It was attacked many times by the Irish, the Vikings and the Anglo-Normans. The site was devastated in the mid-16th century and then abandoned. But even without this centre of Christian learning, Christianity thrived. Some say Ireland is more Catholic than the Vatican. The landscape is dotted with monasteries and churches. They're often situated in very special places, numinous, mysterious, and moving. Holy Christian sites were often established in ones already held to be sacred according to earlier Celtic beliefs. The presence of the divine can be felt, some say, in places of such natural beauty and seclusion. Holy wells places of pilgrimage are to be found within groves of trees. A profane reason for hiding places of Catholic worship from view emerged when the English tried to suppress Catholicism and close churches. The faithful had to hold mass outdoors. Some sites are truly magical and still draw pilgrims from across Ireland.
At this holy spring, the murmuring of the water, the dappled sunlight, the beauty of the place, the tranquility and remoteness can move the soul. It's said you can see the spirit of a monk who once lived here in the water. The water is believed to heal burns and improve the eyesight. Ireland had a rich polytheist religion. The natural world was home to spirits. Trees, it said, were venerated. Then in the fifth century, St. Patrick brought Christianity to the island. But pre-Christian motifs and practices were never eradicated from the culture. The most impressive archaeological remains from ancient times are the dolmen, or stone-lined burial chambers that date back to the Neolithic period. Ireland is rich in archaeological treasures. The ruins of castles, monasteries and manor houses add a note of mystery and melancholy to the landscape. Humans may have abandoned these settlements centuries ago, but other tenants have taken their place. Macross Abbey was once an important ecclesiastical site, a Franciscan friary established in the 15th century. Now it's inhabited by colonies of bats. Connor Keller is probably Ireland's leading bat conservationist. He's been researching these small nocturnal flying mammals for years, and he wants people to appreciate how amazing these creatures really are. He's here to establish which species roost at Muckross Abbey. Uh, 
Um, this is one of the pieces of equipment I use. It's called a harp trap or a turtle trap. Um, it's to catch bats in flight. And as the bat come along here, they're met with these uh, double layer of fish gut or uh, fishing line. And the bat actually flies through the force, gets tangled in it, and then hopefully he'll get caught by the second knot again and he'll slide down them. He won't be harmed or anything. And then he heads into the bag here, slides down to the bottom of it. And if he crawls up, he'll actually go in behind this plastic layer here and then he can't actually get out of that so he just settles down and he tends to drop his body temperature and goes to sleep there then. And then the beauty of it is I can walk away from this and leave it for some time before having to come back. I'm not worried about the animal getting injured or him disappearing or flying off or escaping because once he's in the bag, normally they just go to sleep so it's easy enough to catch them. Connor explores every nook and cranny of the ruins. Nine species of bat are represented in Ireland, and he suspects at least three of them are here at Muckross Abbey. This kind of research he does without pay, he earns his living writing reports on bat populations for large building projects, as bats' roosts are protected by law in Ireland. This is a Dorbenton's bat. This one is a water specialist. He feeds over a um, smooth surface of water. And what he does is he goes along it like a hovercraft and he dips down into the surface. He's got these large back feet and he uses them to gaff insects out of the top of the water because he needs this big trawling area to be able to pick the insects out of the water. But mostly in Ireland, these roost in old ruins beside rivers. You know, mills, for instance, if you've got um, disused warehouses beside rivers. So any old buildings, any old ruins that are nearby a river are always um, potential roosts for this particular species. So old abbeys, castles, mills, old ruined churches, ideal spots for this little guy along any of the rivers in Ireland. Other bats may have set up home in the undercroft. In unspoiled areas, bats tend to live in trees, taking over woodpeckers' nests, for example. But most of Ireland's woodlands have long since been destroyed. One of the few remaining areas of natural woodland is to be found in Glenvey National Park in County Donegal. Forests cover just 10% of the land in Ireland, making it one of the least forested countries in Europe. The Normans and then the English estate owners felled most stands of oak to make way for farming and to build ships. But Ireland wants its forests back. Around the turn of the millennium, a program of reforestation was launched. Ash too was once common. The ancient Celts made implements out of ash wood. A few years ago, there were almost no ash trees left. And Ireland's national sport is partly to blame.
Hurling is virtually unknown elsewhere in the world, but in Ireland every village, neighbourhood and county has its own hurling team. The basics are simple. Two teams of 15 players equipped with wooden sticks or hurlies aim to hit a small ball between the opponent's goalposts, either above or below the crossbar. It's a very fast-moving game. It's also very ancient, dating back to the Celts. It's been played in Ireland for at least 2,000 years, perhaps even three. Later, the English rulers banned the game for a while. But hurling was revived and again became very popular. The consequence of that was that countless ash trees were felled to make the sticks, until none were left. Since the reforestation began so recently, the newly planted ash trees are much too young to harvest. So ash wood is imported from England, Scandinavia and Poland. Jimmy Ryan is in his 80s and still remembers ash trees growing here in Ireland. He's a carpenter in Killinall, County Tipperary, and has been making hurleys for more than 40 years. He makes each one by hand. He's not deterred from crafting a fine product by the competition, cheap models from abroad. When he started, he was the only carpenter in the county to make hurleys. And he's only ever used one kind of wood. Uh, ash, the nature of ash is flexible. The nature of ash is that the grain runs long through the length of hurley. The nature of oak runs long, but the timber is too heavy. The nature of elm is it snaps. There's no long grain, but the texture and the, the flexibility of the ash as it runs in the... If a fella... I once, one fellow once compared an ash, compared a hurley, and he said that to, to, the grain in it was like your boot laces. You could bend it and it would never break. But I was, and I was you know, going over the top. Jimmy's grandchildren will soon be playing the game, as do his children and as he himself did when he was younger. Many of Ireland's greatest players are his customers. They come from all over the country to visit his workshop and select a perfect new hurley. Jimmy also customizes his products. Some lads like a heavy hurley, some lads like a light hurley. That's, I think I'm an at, at an advantage that I'm making hurleys by hand. Because if you come into me, I can make a hurley to suit any design you bring in. If I make hurleys by a machine, it's uniform. The whole way through. No, end of story, it's uniform. But I can keep at it. As you said, you see me feeling it. Yeah, I keep at it until I'm comfortable with the hurley and satisfied. It takes him about 20 minutes to make a hurley, and he sells them for 20 euros a piece. On average, they last just three months because they take a lot of thwacking in the high-energy, high-impact game. Jimmy wants to see hurleys made of Irish ash again, so that the most Irish of games will be truly rooted in the Irish soil. <laughs> The felling of the forests without systematic replanting was a disaster for the country. 
Now the goals of forestry management are reforestation and sustainable harvesting. On through the gentle rolling landscapes of the Midlands and back to Ballinasloe. It's the second day of the horse fair. Dermot Connolly still hasn't sold his Connemara pony. Others appear to be having more success. Miley Cash is Ireland's biggest horse dealer and the grand old man of the fair. He works fast. When he sees a horse he wants, he buys it right away. He's already acquired a dozen today. A deal is sealed with two slaps of the hand. There are no written contracts, invoices or receipts. And like everyone else, Miley Cash pays cash. He has his purchases marked with a big red C. It's going good. It's going good. People are selling anyway. I know it's a bad trade, but they're getting them sold. You know, so things are moving, which is a good thing. As prices are still low, he seizes the opportunity and buys a lot of horses. Prices range from a few hundred euros for a solid workhorse to several thousand for a fine hunter. Miley buys about 80 animals over the course of the weekend. He'll sell most of them straight away to clients in England, Belgium and France who are all fans of Irish horses. Well, they have a brain. They have a good brain. If you teach them something once, that's there for all times. You know, no matter what you do with them, jump them, drive them and harness or hunt. Like to hunt, you couldn't, you couldn't hunt a German horse. No, he wouldn't be used to jumping wire. He wouldn't be used to ditches. You know, well, as they're here on the land, they meet every kind of an obstacle. Walls and hedges, like all around them. And if they learn it from a young age to jump. They just this implanted in their head. Dermot Connolly also sings the praises of Ireland's horses to anyone willing to listen. And I suppose the climate um, dictates that we have lush green grass and a lot of the, the land in, in Ireland, in certain areas of Ireland, is limestone land. Um, and horses are, are, are raised on limestone land. It gives them a strong bone. And um, that's, that's part of the, one of the secrets. Maybe I shouldn't be telling you this, Jan, but uh, it's part of uh, why uh, Ireland has been so successful in breeding quality animals. Late in the afternoon, someone does take an interest in Dermot's Connemara pony. He wants to buy it for his granddaughter. The pony finally changes hands for 1,800 euros, 200 less than Dermot's starting price.
After two busy days and thousands of sales, the Ballinasloe Horse Fair draws to a close. The horses are back in their stables and the breeders and dealers go down to the pub. Neither the boomiers nor the bust nor the slow recovery can keep the Irish out of their pubs. It's a tradition that will never die. Back to Macross Abbey. Connor Kelleher has deployed his bat detector in his quest to identify all the species roosting in the ruins. Human hearing only goes up to so far, about 18 kilohertz, and the bats are shouting at anything using echolocation up to about uh, maybe 110, 115 kilohertz in the Irish bat fauna. So any of that is beyond our hearing range, really. So in order to be able to hear them, we use little devices like this, which uh, takes in the bat sound through a little microphone up here, and with a little bit of electronic gadgetry, it's, it lowers the frequency into a speaker here that we can hear. A bat is indeed twittering in the undercroft. This is a little lesser horseshoe bat. Uh, it's a juvenile because he's got an all grey coat at the minute. But he's uh, only about eight, nine weeks old now. He's got this very peculiar little pig shaped nose. And the reason for that is instead of going around emitting his echolocation through his mouth like other bats do, he actually goes around and he emits his sounds out through his nostrils and his nose. And this little uh, disc shape here helps to focus the sound, an absolutely magical sound. It's like a very musical kind of a, a warbling sound. I just turned on this one here now when he starts twittering, we'll be able to hear it. It's remarkable to think that's coming out of his nose. You know. Thanks to the clever bat box device, these fascinating sounds become audible to humans. All in all, bats deserve greater attention. People have this mistaken idea as well that when they see a bat flying across their garden at night, they normally don't get a good look at it, it's just a silhouette. So. Um, they don't get familiar with it like they would with the birds during the daytime, so they can easily tell the difference between a wren and a robin or a magpie and a crow. But when it comes to the bats, they think all bats are the same. When they see one one night, they think it's the same as it's the one they saw the previous night, but it could be two different species. And it's only when you see them in the hen that you can actually tell the differences. They've got bigger ears, they've got smaller ears, they've got bigger feet, smaller feet, they've got funny noses, they've got ordinary noses. So you can actually tell them apart once you get them up close. The harp net in the Great Hall has proved to be an effective trap. Inside is a representative of a species that Connor very much likes. A 
It's a brown long-eared bat. Um, he's probably the most photogenic species we have because he's got these lovely large eyes. But um, he's got these huge ears, they're almost as long as his body because instead of going around shouting echolocation like the other bats, he actually goes out whispering his sounds because some of the moths have actually got hearing organs that allow them to hear the high frequency sounds of bats. So he tries to sneak up on them, you know. So he's a whispering bat species and in order to hear the echoes that are coming back to him of his very weak whispers, he needs these huge ears then to be able to hear the whispers when they return. But he's a very, very timid little creature, this one, of all the bats. He's probably my favourite because he's the sweetest little one of them. Connor has confirmed his hypothesis. There are indeed three species of bat roosting in the ruins of the abbey. Three out of the nine known to live in Ireland. Raised bogs cover large stretches of the Midlands. Peatlands, that is fens, raised bogs and blanket bogs, cover almost one-sixth of Ireland. The mild, damp climate is conducive to the growth of peat. About one-tenth of the bogs are used for industrial peat harvesting. Three million tonnes of peat are burned as fuel each year in Ireland and account for about a third of its energy consumption. Peat is an important resource for a country with hardly any fossil fuels of its own. But peat harvesting has ravaged large stretches of land and the authorities have decided that no new fields will be exploited. The company responsible for the mechanized harvesting of peat, Bord Namona, which is part owned by the state, is turning to alternative renewable sources of energy, such as wind and biomass. Spent bogs are being reclaimed, cleared up and replanted. John Maguire is a retired fisherman who cuts peat for his own use to heat his home just like his ancestors always did. A stretch of peat bog on public land near his village was divided up among the local families ages ago. For John Maguire, digging peat is not only about collecting fuel. Well, it's healthy. You're out on the top of a mountain and, and we're free out here and no bosses, <laughs> you know, and it's very healthy out here, you know. In the springtime you hear the various birds whistling in the air and getting ready to make their nests and what have you, nature, you know. The young lambs coming on the hill and, you know, yeah. He cuts the peat into blocks and leaves them to dry. A week is enough if the weather's good. As environmental protection becomes ever more important and people become more aware of the value of peatlands, the tradition of peat digging is unlikely to survive much longer. Nurturing bogs across the Midlands is slowly getting underway. This is a taste of the future.
Lock Borer Parklands have been created on the cutaway bogs of County Offaly. It's the pilot project for a huge conservancy and reclamation project that will cover 80,000 hectares in 11 counties. Cotton grass has sprung up, and all kinds of moss thrive here too. The vegetation is typical for acidic, waterlogged, raised bogs. Nature is reclaiming the land. These carnivorous pitcher plants from Canada feed on beetles and spiders. Once trapped, there's no escape. Sundews also eat insects. The soil is poor in nitrogen. Insects provide the missing nutrients. There's seldom a happy end for the victim. It's rare for a creature to get away. Irish hares are among the few species of mammals that live in the parklands. Lapwings live here too. Lapwing populations have been declining across Europe, but here they breed and brood in peace. More than 130 species of bird can be found in the Loch Bora parklands. Partridges are not an endangered species, here they're procreating at a healthy rate.
This too is Ireland, the gentle side of the island, away from the rocky coast and the famous tourist sites. Meadows, rivers and lakes, mystical sites, bats, horses and peatlands. All kinds of wonders that will delight anyone willing to venture into the heart of Ireland.